be seated. It truly is wonderful, the grace of Jesus, the grace of God, and our realization of that begins with our realization of our sin. If we think that we deserve things, we think that we're entitled to things, we're going to underestimate and underappreciate the grace of God. But when we realize our sinfulness and how undeserving we are, how much we deserve judgment instead of grace, then every little bit of grace is going to be appreciated. And if you take the time to think about all that could go wrong, all that could fail to go right in your life, even the, even the, the small things, I was, I was thinking through a list of things that I'm thankful for this morning, and they all have a theme. I'm thankful for a warm coat. I'm thankful for a car with a heater. I'm thankful for a church building with, with central air and, and things like that. And, and uh, the heat goes out for people. I'm thankful it didn't go out for us this morning here at church. If the building was, was uh, with, with no heat whatsoever, we probably wouldn't have church. Um, if your car didn't start this morning, you wouldn't be here. I'm thankful for those things, that, they, that those things did not fail. And of course, when we talk about the grace of God, I was reading <clears throat> a devotional this morning that was talking about um, speaking from Proverbs and... It, was, it says, uh, Ver, Proverbs 14, 4 says, Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. And it was saying how if, if you don't have an ox, then your, your barn is clean. There's, there's no animal there to make it dirty, and so you don't have to work at keeping it clean. But if you don't have an ox, you also cannot farm and, and plow and, and perform all of the tasks that an ox can do for you. And so it does take work to produce things. There's toil, but toil brings rewards. Toil brings fruit. And so if we're interested in the fruit, then we ought to be willing to work. And just the fact that we can work and bring forth fruit for the Lord in his service is an, is a, an evidence of his grace. And we can be thankful. Yes, it is, it is hard work to live for God, but it's a, a measure of his grace that we can see God work and see God bring fruit in our lives, see God bring fruit in others' lives because of how we have been laboring for him. And we can be thankful for these things. There's so much to be thankful for if we're willing to look at it, look for it. Last week, as you'll remember, in this Sunday School Hour, we began our study of grace in Scripture, and specifically grace as part of the character of God, God's grace to us. And we talked, we defined grace, and we, t we talked about some of the, the definitions and the things in Scripture that we find that tell us what grace is. We spent some time in Isaiah chapter 33, and verse 2 of Isaiah 33 is a special encouragement to me. It should be an encouragement to us. It says, O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. And that, that's a pretty good definition of grace. The arm, the strength that we need in the morning. Every day we wake up, we need strength for that day. We need help, we need grace. But we also need grace, salvation in time of trouble. Sometimes things happen, unexpected emergencies, crises, <clears throat> and, and we can't. We're not up to it. We're not enough for it. We need help. We need grace. And God is that for us. God is full of infinite power, infinite knowledge, infinite wisdom, and infinite goodness. He desires to employ all of that for our good and for his glory. And these two purposes, for our good and for his glory, they're inextricably intertwined in the mind of God we don't always live that way. Sometimes what we think is our good is very different from what brings glory to God because we don't th see things properly. But God, when he works, our good, the good of his people and his glory are always one and the same. They're always <clears throat> not the same, but they're, they're together. When God does something for our good, it always glorifies him because he does only good things. Good things glorify God. When God does something for his glory, it is always good for his people. God doesn't step on us in order to lift himself up. 
We do that to each other sometimes. And that's kind of the business world. Dog eat dog, that's what the phrase means. You, you have to step on people sometimes to get ahead. God doesn't do that. God doesn't step on us in order to make himself look good. If it makes him look good, it's for our good as well. If it brings glory to him, it's good for his people. Sometimes we wouldn't look at judgment of sinners as being good for them necessarily. What's good for them is to repent and be right with God. What's good for them is to avoid eternal damnation, eternal judgment. And so we wouldn't necessarily think about judging sinners for all eternity as being a good thing for sinners, but it is a righteous thing for God. It's a righteous thing to do, and God is just in that. But for God's people who have been forgiven, anything that is good for us does bring glory to God and vice versa. And so when we think about God's grace doing both of those things, being good for us, bringing glory to him, it ought to help us trust him more. Can we trust God this way? Do we believe that that's true? When challenges come and we need God's grace, do we complain about that or do we rejoice? Unfortunately, we naturally prefer temporal security over the presence of God's amazing grace. We would rather not need God's grace. That's often how we live. We would rather have things easy and not need to go to God for grace because we like it to be easy. But when it's easy and we don't have God's grace, we miss out on fellowship with him. We miss out on knowing him at a deeper level. And so we ought to be willing. It's not that we ask for trouble. It's not that we ask for trials. Um, but we ought to be willing for them to come so that we can experience God's person in a deeper way. And I should be our desire for God to help us to see these things from his perspective. As we've talked about, mercy doesn't have an application if there's no sin. If there's no offense, there's no mercy that can be offered because there are no offenders. And if we do not need the Lord, there's no application for his grace. And so when we do need him, we ought to be thankful when his grace is poured out because now we can see a side of his character that we haven't seen before. Let's pray and then we'll talk about, we'll look at times in scripture where God's grace is demonstrated and it teaches us. When God demonstrates and pours out his grace on these people in scripture, it teaches us some things about God and his grace. Let's pray and then we'll get into that. Lord, thank you for your grace. Help us not to overlook it or to minimize it. Help us not to take it for granted but to appreciate it and to praise you for it. Lord, when we stop and think about how really you are not obligated to, to show it to us. We're the sinners. And it's only because of the goodness of your character that you show us grace. Lord, it should make us praise you and thank you. Help us to have that attitude. I pray that you be glorified this morning. Lord, help us to be thankful this morning by the examples that we see in Scripture. Help us to come into a, a deeper and a closer knowledge and relationship with you as a result. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> God's grace demonstrated in Scripture. If we're going to better appreciate God's grace poured out in our own lives, we need to appreciate its presence recorded in Scripture. And turn to Isaiah chapter 30. God's grace in past events reveals important truths about him. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, which says, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And there are a number of points in these verses that tell us some things about God and about his grace. And I'd like to just point them out briefly. First of all, it says, And therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. I think it's, uh, it's a blessing to note that our gracious Lord cares enough to wait for us. I think we all have a, a tendency to be impatient at times, and we are prone to greater impatience 
when we believe that the thing we're waiting on is of little importance. I'm not going to wait for something that is meaningless. I'm not going to spend what I view as my valuable time waiting for something that is meaningless and, and, and no importance whatsoever. And when we compare ourselves to God, we could say it, God would be justified for feeling that way about us, but he doesn't. He's gracious toward us. He loves us. And it says, the Lord will wait so that he can be gracious to us. He waits because he wants his grace to be always on time. I'm thankful that God is never late and he's never early. He's always on time. He always gives us the grace at just the right time. Not when we always want it, but his grace is always right on time. God's grace is given to us who also need his mercy. We deserve punishment, and, and we don't deserve his mercy, but he gives his mercy to us. But we also do not deserve grace. And we've talked about mercy being the, the tendency, the <clears throat> predisposition to show, to, to withhold judgment to those who are offenders, to be good to those who are offenders. We are sinners. We've offended God's law. We've broken God's law. We do not deserve mercy but he gives us his mercy. God also gives us his grace. And so we can praise him not only for his grace, but his mercy. We see here in this verse, these verses, it says, waiting on God's grace brings blessing and joy. At the end of verse 18, it says, blessed are all they that wait for him. Have you ever been tempted to bail on God, to give up, to stop waiting? And, and I talked about how we, we do not want to wait for things that are meaningless and of little importance. How, how terrible then is it when we fail to wait for God? But if we will wait for him, it says, Blessed are all they that wait for him. Waiting on God will never disappoint. Waiting on his grace brings great joy. God's grace dries our tears. It says, it says they, Thou shalt weep no more. In verse 19, God's grace dries our tears. Have you ever experienced that? Crying out to God, you're in, you're in turmoil, you're in distress, you need God's help, and then his grace comes, and it's sufficient, and it's enough, and it doesn't necessarily take the problem away, but it comforts you in the problem and dries your tears. doesn't mean you don't feel loss anymore or, or, or pain, but it dries your tears. It makes it, it, makes it okay. God's grace quiets our cry, says he will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry, in verse 19. Very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. God's grace comes when we cry out to God. He wants us to cry out to him. This isn't just simply, you know, paying the bills and, and we, when a bill comes in, we have the money, we just pay the bill and it's taken care of. God wants us to, to cry to him, to say, Lord, I, I don't know what to do about this. I need your help. I'm helpless. Please give me your grace. And we cry out to God and we see this in the Old Testament. We're going to talk about some of these things. When we cry out to God, his grace quiets our cry because his grace is sufficient. And it says he will answer thee at the end of verse 19 when he shall hear it he will answer thee god's grace answers our true need we don't always have our superficial needs met or met in the way that we prefer but god's grace is always exactly what we need he will answer the true need that we have and i mentioned earlier we don't like needing god's grace we would prefer things to be easy we don't like being in trouble we don't like being in crises we don't like being in need. We don't like waiting for God's grace because we want it now. But God is always on time, and when his sufficient grace is given, we praise him for it. We look back and we see that we've grown because we had to wait. We've grown because we were in need, and now he met our need, and he is glorified. It was good for us, and he was glorified. These two purposes are intertwined. And so... It ought to be then our attitude to say, Lord, I want you to change my perspective so that when I need your grace again, I don't fret, I don't complain, I don't grumble and bellyache about it. I just go to you for grace, trusting you to give your grace yet again. 
all of God's attributes. We could talk about his power, we could talk about his holiness, about his, his omniscience, omnipotence, all of these things. All of his traits are impossible for us to fully describe and fully, fully analyze using human language. We don't even understand it all, much less be able to articulate it. But, but we find different illustrations and different words to describe part of the whole. And there are some demonstrations, some illustrations of God's grace in Scripture that show us different parts of the whole. And I'd like, us to, I'd like to point out a few of these today. We see God's grace poured out on people in Scripture. And each example is a little bit different, but it tells us something about God and His grace. Turn to uh, Genesis chapter 6 as we look at some of these examples. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. This is the first instance of the word grace in scripture and it's a i think it's a uh, an important example of it tells us something about god's grace that carries throughout scripture it's it's true wherever we find it genesis chapter 6 verse 8 very short verse it says but noah found grace in the eyes of the lord i don't think noah was just Living, living his life, walking through life, not mindful of God or the need for grace and just kind of stumbled on it. It says he found grace. I think it was something that he was desiring, something that he was seeking, something that he needed and knew that he needed. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God's grace in Noah's life was, was shown in a number of different ways. And you know the story of Noah, no doubt. Noah built the ark. And he and his family and a whole bunch of animals went on the ark. And God sent a flood and destroyed the world as a judgment for sin. The, the world was filled with wickedness. All of the other humans, except for Noah's family, all people, the, the thoughts and imaginations of their heart were only evil continually. And God judged the world. But God showed grace to Noah. Noah was a sinner, just like the rest of them. Noah was not sinning like the rest of them, but he was a sinner like the rest of them, and God didn't have to show grace to Noah. God didn't have to spare him, but he did. He showed grace to him, as we know. God spared the, the human race through Noah's family. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.5 says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. God's grace in Noah's life was shown in salvation from drowning. Noah didn't drown. Noah and his family didn't drown like the rest of the world did. Noah was given a message of righteousness, as I just read. 2 Peter 2, 5 calls him a preacher of righteousness. There was, there was righteousness that he was preaching. He was no doubt telling this, the people that he, he came in contact with, God's sending judgment. God's sending a flood. I'm building an ark for a reason. God told me to. You better, you better believe this message. He gave him a message. That's God's grace, being given a message to preach, a message to tell others. And you and I have that message today as well. God gave Noah the needed abilities to build the ark, to prepare provisions, to care for the animals, and to begin human civilization again after the flood. All of these are examples of God's grace, things that Noah didn't deserve, but God gave him for a purpose. We see God's character shown in this in this one instance of, of grace in Noah's life. And I think all of this is a good illustration, a good picture of salvation in our lives. If, you're, if you are not saved and you die in your sins, you will be judged just like the world was judged by water when Noah was living. Praise God that he gives us grace, that he is willing to rescue all sinners from the death and destruction of hell. Praise God for salvation. And if you've been saved, there's an, this is an example of God's grace that you can, you have something in common with Noah. God's grace. Let's look at another example of God's grace. Look at Exodus chapter 16. We should thank God every day for our salvation. Not take it for granted, not forget about it, but thank Him every day for the grace given from God so that we could be saved and glorify that grace by witnessing to the lost so that they can also be rescued. Exodus chapter 16, verse 11 
It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass at that, uh, that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, an omer for every man. According to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And the children of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And we won't continue reading for time's sake, but we understand the manna, and, and it was <clears throat> small seeds, basically, that they ground up and turned into bread. They baked their bread. And it came six days a week. Didn't come on Saturday. It, they were not to work on Saturday. And so they would gather twice as much as they needed to eat on Friday. And then they'd have some on Saturday to eat. But if they gathered two days worth on Monday so that they wouldn't have to go out and gather on Tuesday, well, what they gathered on Monday and kept overnight spoiled. It bred worms and stank. And, and this passage tells us God's grace. It's a, it's a beautiful picture of God's grace. Six days a week, um, or six, yes, five, five days a week, they would only gather for one day. And I imagine, what if their children went to bed that night saying, Daddy, will we have anything to eat tomorrow? We ate all the manna. We don't have any quail. We ate, we ate that up. There's nothing in our, in our tent to eat. What are, the, the pantry is, is empty. What are we going to eat tomorrow? Well, God's going to have to give us more manna tomorrow. Yeah, but what if he doesn't? Well, we're, we're going to go hunt, hungry. Yeah, we'll just have to trust God for that. And the next morning, there was some more. Can we gather? Let's gather a week's worth, Daddy. It's all over the place. No, we're just, just one day. Because if we try to get more, if we try to hoard it and, and pile it up and take care of next week and next month, it's, it's just going gonna, gonna to spoil. It's going to stink. It's going to be putrid. But... But what if he doesn't give it? We're just going to have to trust God for that tomorrow. Manna, every day. It's just a great picture of God's grace. We want to, to look at our life and we want to say, well, I've got these problems. Lord, can you answer them now? I want to know that next week's problems are taken care of. I want to know that in six months, when this thing comes, comes due, when, when this thing is, is happening, that, that, that it's all taken care of. I want to see it now. But God says, no. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. When you need grace tomorrow, I'll give you grace tomorrow. I'm only going to give you enough for today. Every day, you're going to need me. And we don't like that. We want to be independent. We want to know it's all taken care of. And, and this, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing the idea of preparing for retirement. I think that can be a wise way to plan for the future. But we can take that approach to other areas of life and say, well, you know, I already know that all of these issues in my life are taken care of. I don't have to worry about anything. I can just kick back and relax and take it easy mentally in my heart or whatever. I don't need God's grace. My problems are all gone. But God wants us to need him. God wants us to seek him. And so instead of complaining that we need his grace, we should be thankful that it's always sufficient. Thankful that we need to go back to it. I remember the, in Proverbs the, the writer says, give me enough food, not too much that I'll forget God and, not, and, and stray from him. I, I've got more than I need. I don't need God. I don't, I don't need his help. And I don't want too little that makes me curse God. I want just enough. God gives us just enough. This manna shows us some things about God's grace. It's, it's daily, but it's supernatural. There's no explanation. How do you, how do you explain manna falling from, from the sky, food falling from the sky every single day? You can't explain it. It's supernatural. Only God, only God could do that. And so it is with grace. It's satisfying. It, it talks about the flavor. And 
I don't see the verse right now. Oh, verse 31, the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. A pleasant taste. It's satisfying. It, it filled them up. It met their nutritional needs. Only God could do that, and grace is that way. I can't explain to you why grace satisfies me. It just does. And if you've, if you've never known God's grace, you can't really understand it very well. You just need to go to him and get it. It's daily. You can only use what you need. And sometimes God does give us grace for tomorrow. He gives us, he's capable of giving us some advanced grace, but usually he doesn't choose to do that. I think about, let's look at verse 35. And the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. And in, I believe it's the book of Joshua, it says as soon as they crossed over into Canaan, there was no more manna, because they didn't need it anymore. God gives us what we need only as long as we need it. This manna was a wonderful provision, and it's for a specific purpose and a specific time. And when we no longer need that grace for that reason, that, that use, he, he doesn't give it to us anymore. He gives us grace in other forms. Do we complain because we need grace? Or do we thank God because he gives it? I'm thankful that he's got an infinite amount of grace to give to us. I was thinking about, I think all of you need grace, just like I do. How many believers are there around the world that go to God for grace? How many people, how many lost people get grace from God to do, to fulfill God's purposes in whatever way, to seek the Lord for salvation, whatever it is, I'm glad God doesn't run out of grace. If it was, if it was a first come, first served, and when, when God's grace is exhausted for the day, you're out of luck, I probably wouldn't get all that I needed. I'm thankful that doesn't happen. God has enough for all of us. Turn to Ruth chapter 2, another example of God's grace. We've just seen God's grace is daily, it's unlimited, it's for a specific purpose. But we find other illustrations showing us some things about God's grace. <clears throat> Ruth chapter 2. This story of Boaz and Ruth is a wonderful account of God's grace to many people who also did not deserve it. Chapter 2, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. You'll remember Naomi and her family, her husband and her, their two sons, went Left, they left Israel and went to Moab because there was a famine in Israel. We don't read that God approved of that move, but they'd made it. And in Moab, uh, Naomi's husband and her two sons both died. Naomi was left a widow, and their two sons married Moabite women. Those women were left widows, and Ruth was a Moabitess. They, Ruth and Naomi came back to Israel. Ruth left her homeland to come back to Israel with Naomi. In verse 2, And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. So now Ruth is looking for grace from a landowner, from a farmer. And God, in his grace, had commanded Israel, this is how you help to care for widows and those who need, who do not have a man to, who, with, with a, an inheritance to take care of them. Ruth was, was, expe was looking for charity, was looking for, for um, free provision from, some of, from someone who would show it to her. She was, she was a foreigner. She didn't deserve it from them, but it was grace. And so she found a man... It says in verse 3, And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz. She didn't plan this. This is just how it happened. But God was in control. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? This woman Ruth. He didn't know her name. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And, and, Ru and Boaz says, Well, care for her. I, I've heard how she followed Naomi, and I want to show her grace. We see grace from Boaz to Ruth. And, and in Boaz, we see a lot of uh, elements of Christ. 
He's a good picture of Christ in many ways. And what a gracious man he was. He, he says, let her reap. And then he, he, tells, her, he tells her in verse 9 or verse 8, don't, don't go to another field to glean. You stay here. I'll take care of you. He didn't, know her. he didn't even know who she was. Didn't know her by sight. But as soon as he knew her, he was showing grace to her. And she says, I don't deserve this. Why are you, why are you showing me such grace? And he said, because I've heard how you followed your mother-in-law and how you came back here. He says in verse 12, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. That's when we qualify for God's grace, when we trust him, when we come to him and be under his care. So he, he feeds her uh, a meal. He says, he tells the reapers, uh, when you're reaping, drop some grain for her to pick up. Don't make her reap all of it that she's gathering. You, you, you break it off and just let her pick it up. All of these ways showing her grace. As we know, Naomi then, uh, in verse chapter 3, verse 1, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And the Lord brings to Naomi's mind... You might be able to find a husband in this. You, you, you're a widow. God can still give you a husband. And so later, if we, if we skip down a little ways, we see that um, so far Boaz desired to generously bless Ruth because of her kind actions toward Naomi. Boaz wasn't obligated to do that. He showed her grace. And through him, God was showing grace to Ruth. We see that Boaz's generosity encouraged Naomi in chapter 3, verse 20. It says, And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Naomi, when she came back, she said, Don't call me Naomi. That name means sweetness. Call me Mara. That name means bitter. My life has become very bitter. And her words to Ruth stir me because... I think it was a great encouragement to Naomi that this man, Boaz, was demonstrating that God's grace had not left Naomi's life. God is going to take care of us. God's, God, he, she felt God had taken everything from her. her. Her husband and two sons. Is God's grace spent? Is it dried up? No, it's not. God is still caring. Blessed be he of the Lord. So God, Boaz showing grace to Ruth was a blessing to Naomi as well. And Naomi then was prompted to bless Ruth in, in looking, trying to provide her, trying to, trying to help her have a husband. He, she counseled Ruth on how to proceed. And we won't go through it all, but look at chapter 4, verse 8. <clears throat> Ruth goes and lays down at the feet of Boaz. In verse 8, it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or or rich, and now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requirest. This was a cultural uh, statement that she was making, and he felt the kindness of it. He was an older man, and Ruth was saying, "I'm willing to marry you if you're willing to marry me." And he was blessed by that. So Boaz's kindness and grace to Ruth blessed Ruth, and it blessed Naomi, and in turn, God's grace through Ruth was a blessing to Boaz. As we skip down to chapter four. They got married, and Ruth had a son. Verse 17, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, chapter 4, 13, and she was his wife. And when, he went, and, he went, and when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman that his name may be famous in Israel. And verse 16, And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. God's grace in Naomi's life gave her an adopted grandson, R gave Ruth, a Moabitess, a son, 
gave Boaz, a faithful Israelite man, a son. And that son was the grandfather of King David. God's grace. We see many blessings from, from God's grace here. Naomi and Ruth suffered widowhood. And Boaz was single a long time. God's grace met all of these needs in a spectacular way. And so I would ask us, is it better to not suffer need? Or is it better to have our need met by God's grace? Boaz could have married and had a typical life. And instead, he had a very non-typical life. Instead, he has a very special place in Scripture, and the same is with Naomi and Ruth. God's grace. We could talk about the widow in 2 Kings chapter 4. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. Again, God's grace giving us things that we do not deserve. Good things in our need, meeting the need in a wonderful way. God does not record all of the examples of his grace, of course, but we do see many examples. I'm just mentioning a few here. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. Terrible need in her life. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Great debt, and there was a great loss, and there was great fear. She needed God's grace. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. They were very poor. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and, brought, and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. We need grace because of loss. This woman lost her husband. And when we have loss, we need God's grace. We need God's grace because of disadvantages and hindrances. This woman was in great debt, and we don't know why. How did she get in debt? Maybe her husband made some poor financial choices. Maybe, maybe they had great financial dis misfortune. They didn't make bad choices, but bad things happen sometimes. We, unexpected things happen. I don't know how this debt came about, but she was very much at a disadvantage. We need grace because of what we might call cascading needs. One need creates another need, which creates another need, which creates another need. She was in debt, and that's a need. But because she was in debt, the creditor was authorized to take her sons away to be bondmen, to work for that creditor for free while they paid off the debt. What a terrible thing. She needed God's grace. And we can either lament because of our need and complain and, 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 and live in sorrow, or we can praise God because of vessels or reasons to need His grace, places where His grace is needed. I think about Psalm 84, verses 5 and 6. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. This word Baca in this psalm appears to be a very difficult place, a very difficult valley, a valley of weeping. And it was apparently a, a very dry place. There's no water there. It's a very difficult place. You go there, there's suffering, passing through this dry valley. Yet with God's grace, this dry valley, our suffering, He can turn those places into a place of provision and victory. Dry pools. We can, we can lament over empty vessels. This woman had a bunch of empty vessels. And we, one pitcher of oil. How, what can it do with all of these vessels? God, I, we need help. But those empty vessels turned into receptacles of God's grace. And so it just depends on what we're looking at. I have so many needs. Why is God forsaking me? Well, yes, we could look at it that way. Or we could say, I have so many needs and so many 
places to put God's grace, so many receptacles to, to take it, to, 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 to store it in. I wonder how God's going to meet these needs. I have so many opportunities to praise God after he's given the grace. God can use anything to deliver us from our need. In this woman's case, he used one pot of oil to pay off her debt, rescue her sons from being bondmen, and it says, Elisha, Elisha says, live on the rest. Live thou and thy children on the rest. All of it came from one insignificant pot of oil. We also see from this passage that God gives us all the grace that we can handle. They were filling the vessels and filling the vessels, one after the other, pouring out of the same pot. Bring me another vessel. There aren't any more. We're full up. Everything's full. And then the oil stayed. God gives us all we can handle and no more. Turn to Matthew chapter 4, another example of God's grace that really is, is more needed in our lives today. But God, is, God doesn't change. And so the grace that he showed in Scripture is the same God of grace, the same grace that he gives us. Matthew chapter 4, this is the passage when Jesus, verse 1, it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And we, we know this passage. The devil came to tempt him and tempted him in three different ways. Jesus physically was very weakened. And when we are in a weakened state, we're vulnerable to temptation. We're vulnerable to sin. Maybe our mind is weakened. We've been thinking about the wrong things. We're discouraged. We're down. We're drifting from the Lord. Maybe our body is weakened and we just, we, we're not, our defenses are not up like they should be. Jesus physically was weakened. He hadn't eaten for 40 days and the devil tempted him with food immediately. Command that these stones be made bread. The devil, the Jesus was not going to give in to the devil. He was not going to give place to the devil but after he resisted temptation and after he quoted scripture and it says, verse 11, then the devil leaveth him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. God gave grace to Jesus Christ. He gives us grace in our need. God's grace is restorative. Psalm 23, 3 says, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. When God gives you grace, he restores you. He knows how to restore your soul. In Genesis 41, Joseph is now brought out of prison. And we know that he was, he was sold into slavery by, by his brothers. And then he was, he was a successful slave for Potiphar. And then falsely accused of immorality and imprisoned. All of it because of crimes that others committed against him. But then after he interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, he was raised to second in command in Egypt. And, it, and we read in chapter 41 that he, would, he married uh, Asenath, the, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And she had two sons by him. And it says, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. The name Manasseh means causing to forget. Why did he name his son Manasseh? For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil in all my father's house. The years of suffering that I've been through, it's all wiped away. It's all melted away because of God's grace. God's grace is restorative to us. God's grace relieves us. God's grace is sent to us. Jesus is suffering in the temptation. Physical weakness was relieved when the angels came and ministered unto him. And God sent angels to do that, just like God sends grace in our life. We could talk about Christ in Gethsemane and the hours leading up to his arrest and his crucifixion. He was in great distress, great agony, and was praying, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And the Bible says there was an angel that appeared unto him from heaven, strengthening him. God's grace gives us the strength we need to go through trials. We would rather be rescued from our trials. Jesus in his humanity did not want to become sin, but he was surrendered to God's will. And God's will was that he be strengthened to go through the trial. God's grace was sufficient, and I'm so thankful that Jesus did go through that so that we could be saved. Elijah experienced this grace when he was running from Jezebel. He, didn't, he just wanted it all to be... He wanted to die and just be taken out of his 
trials, out of his struggles. But instead, God gave him the strength to go through them. This is what God's grace does for us. Paul wrote to Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We would rather be rescued, but instead, often, God's grace is the strength that we need to go through the trial. And so as we look at these examples, and we could go on and on looking at God's grace exhibited in Scripture, its daily grace, its strength to go through. Israel needed the manna to go through the wilderness, not to be rescued from the wilderness. God gave them the manna to bring them through it. God's grace gives us what we need to go through the trial. So what should be our response? Well, we ought to praise the Lord for His grace. But our response should be like the Apostle Paul's response. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I hope that you'll take some time to meditate on God's grace in your life. So many things that could be said, and so many of these things that that I've experienced about God's grace are really hard to describe to others. I know what it's been like. I, I can praise the Lord, and you can do the same. How has God's grace been exhibited in your life? And you ought to praise Him for that. But we ought to desire that grace instead of the temptation to desire to be taken out of the trial. How should we desire God's grace? Well, we see in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, Paul writes and he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. He wanted to be taken out of this. And he said unto them, My grace, unto me, he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. It's an important perspective God's grace was given to relieve a thorn in the flesh. Why was that thorn in the flesh given? Well, I think the messenger of Satan, I think Satan wanted to defeat Paul through it, but God allowed it for another purpose, which is to not let Paul be exalted above measure. So the trial was for Paul's good, and the grace was so Paul could help bear up in the trial. Paul wanted to be removed from the trial, but God's grace was sufficient He wasn't diminished by this thorn. Without the thorn, he was in danger of being defeated by pride. This was his need. Not being lifted up in pride, not and pride goeth before a fall. God was meeting his need through this thorn. And then God met the the need that the trial brought with his grace. Lest I should be exalted above measure. God was gracious to Paul by allowing the thorn... I think it's a blessing to note that the messenger of Satan can still be a tool of God. God is sovereign, and we see that in Job's life as well. Satan desired evil, and God used Satan for good. God's help is sufficient. Whether we perceive it as sufficient or not, it is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. Jesus, God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. It is. God's grace needs no help from us. The weaker we are, the more fully we allow God to work in us. And so we should desire God's grace in our life. We should desire it. We want God's blessing so that we don't need the grace. We want easy things so that we don't need trials, so we don't have trials. That's how we, that's how we live. But we should desire God's grace. And if we see God's grace like God sees it, we will rejoice when our room for it multiplies. Paul says, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. They're not easy, they're not fun, but they're an opportunity for God's grace to be poured out. And so I rejoice in that. It's hard to look at it that way. It really is. But if we are looking at it properly, looking at it from God's perspective then that is how we'll see it. May God give us more vessels to receive his grace in our life. 
Like that woman with all the empty vessels. We could look, she could look at those empty vessels and say, this is just an example, this is just futility laid out here. See, see all of this need? What's God going to do about this? Look at all, this is just proof that God isn't enough. We can look at our need that way. God, if you were really as, as big as you say you are, I wouldn't have these needs. Or we could say, look at all these needs. It's just an opportunity to receive more of God's grace. James chapter 4 tells us that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And so if we'll submit ourselves to him, he will lift us up. He will give us grace. If we fight this process of having the being in need and going to God for grace, we're going to miss out on his grace and miss out on God's power in our lives to accomplish his purposes. We don't like the discomfort that comes with being needy, but we ought to crave the blessings that God's grace offers. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, Above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. How has God given you grace? You ought to be an administer of, a minister of God's grace to others. The more grace that I receive from the Lord, the more I can see that others need grace. The more I love to give grace. It's amazing how when, I don't have, when I've never had any trials and I don't have any need, I start to be more selfish. I start to be more cold-hearted. I, I, I'm not touched by others like I am when I've suffered need and received God's grace. Helps me to care for others more. And God is that way. He wants us to be that way with others. 1 Peter 5, 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. You want to receive God's grace? Humble yourself. That's how we, that's how we receive it. A few verses later in 1 Peter 5, it says, But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is his purpose, for need, for grace, so that we can grow, so that we can be made perfect, so that we can be strengthened and settled. And we ought to submit to that process. There's another blessing that comes with God's grace. Finally, we read in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul writes, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. We prefer things to be easy. We like to have everything provided for, no needs, no sickness, no shortcomings, no, no, no financial needs. We don't, we're, we're good. Everything's easy. That's how we like it. But when we need God's grace and we go to him for grace and we cry out to him and he, he meets our need, we have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we, are, we, we, we see the love of God poured out to us. We experience the communion of the Holy Ghost. And aren't those things more important and more valuable than the, the, the trial, the pain that we go through? Aren't those worth it? I think they are. The grace of God is, is eternal, it's infinite, it cannot be exhausted. God wants to demonstrate his character to us. He wants us to experience him, to fellowship with him, to enjoy his presence, and he wants to give us grace. We need to submit to the trials that come because we know that they are merely opportunities for God to pour his grace out in our lives. And we ought to praise him for being that kind of God, for loving us. And one day we're going to enjoy his grace for all eternity, and we can begin to appreciate it even now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, and Lord, I feel very insufficient to put it into words because it's infinite, it's eternal, it's, it's godly, and Lord, help us to experience it. Lord, you can speak to our hearts and help open our eyes, open our understanding far better than mere words can do for us. 
I pray that you would help us to submit to this process. Help us to draw near to you so that you can pour your grace out in our lives. Help us to cry out to you in our need. Help us not to rely on on the arm of flesh, on on man's devices, on our own strategies and our own resources. Help us to cry out to you and wait for you to show us your grace and then to praise you when you do. Help us not to rebel and to run from trials. Help us not to complain and, and accuse you when we go through needs, but instead help us to praise you and thank you in advance for the grace that you will show. Lord, you are the God of all grace. You promise that you will show grace if we will just trust you and cry out to you. Help us not to to fret about that, but instead to thank you that you want to show us more of your holy character. I pray that you would help us to show grace to others, not just in kindness, but most of all in giving the gospel to those in need. Help us to be instruments of your grace in the life of others. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for showing us your character. Help us to live in that and to live like you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for your attention. We'll be dismissed for just a few minutes and then begin the 11 o'clock service at that time. You're dismissed.